as well as Parks Alexandria and Fairfax. Thanks for being here tonight. We can go continue Welcome. with the Senate. Um, Ladies. Go ahead, Senator Howell. Okay. Hi, I'm Janet Howell. I represent the 32nd district. I'm sitting in my home in Reston, so that will give you an idea of how big this district <laughs> is. It goes, um, it goes basically from Ballston out in a wedge that covers uh, most of Tyson's, um, a lot of Oakton, and um, all of Reston. I've been in the Senate since 1992. I'm second in seniority in the Senate, um, longest serving woman in the history of the Virginia legislature, and chairman of the Senate Finance and Appropriation. <clears throat> and I'm dying to hear what you want to tell us. Um, okay, Senate, uh, uh, Delegate Sullivan and Delegate Lopez, and I'll go last. How's that? Uh, okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Rip Sullivan. I represent the 48th district in uh, the House of Delegates. Uh, most of the 48th is in Arlington. It actually starts down in Crystal City, um, comes up the Potomac, uh, includes Roslyn, and then comes out the RB corridor. Um, I have sort of the opposite side of, of uh, Wilson and Clarendon Boulevard than, than Patrick, uh, and goes up um, up uh, Lee Highway, uh, all the way out, I guess, to uh, Harrison Street, and then it does it crosses the line. <coughs> excuse me, into uh, uh, into Fairfax County, McLean. Uh, I am uh, the uh, chair of the House Democratic Caucus. I serve on the Rules Committee, the uh, Courts Committee, where I chair the the uh, Judicial Subcommittee. I'm on Labor and Commerce and chair the Energy Subcommittee, and I'm on Finance and chair. Uh, the, the very sexily named uh, subcommittee number three, I think. And um, uh, I think that's it. I'm scared of that subcommittee. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Alfonso Lopez. I'm the delegate from the 49th House of Delegates District. Uh, the 49th Delegate District actually is most of South Arlington and Eastern Fairfax. It goes from uh, parts of Route 50 uh, down to um, all of South Island except for Sherlington and Fairlington, uh, and then as far uh, east as, as Pentagon City um, to Bailey's Crossroads, that area from Bailey's Crossroads, everything sort of uh, on the very eastern part of, of, of Fairfax from Bailey's Crossroads up to Seven Corners. Um, uh, basically, if you think about uh, the district is mostly the, the Columbia Pike Corridor. Um, I have been in the House of Delegates since 2012 and I am the uh, ma majority whip for the House Democrats. And I serve on the Rules Committee, on the Labor and Commerce Committee, on the Public Safety Committee, and also on the Agriculture, Natural Chesapeake and Natural Resources Committee. And I'm the chair of the uh, Chesapeake Bay uh, uh, Subcommittee, which deals with most of the water issues in the state. And I'm also proud to be the um, chair of the Virginia Small Business Commission. Um, so honored to be here, as I always love this meeting each year. I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm State Senator Barbara Favola, and I represent a large portion of Arlington, 26 precincts, but I also have portions of Fairfax. I go up the river, so I have McLean and all of Great Falls, and I also have six precincts in Loudoun, again, the northeastern tip of Loudoun. Um, I did represent Arlington on the Arlington County Board as well for 14 years before my Senate career started. And uh, my Senate career started in, I guess, the 2012 session. I was elected in 2011. Um, I chair the Rehab and Social Services Committee. I serve on Transportation, Local Government, the Rules Committee and Agriculture and the Environment. So we're happy to hear your um, comments this evening. If you do want to speak, please raise your hand um, so you could go into the participant function. Um, you can also mention in the chat that you wanna speak, but the chairman would prefer that you go to the participant function and raise your hand. Um, so, Thank you. Hope. Thank the person, I just, I want you to introduce uh, Seema Jane from the league, if you would accept her no. presentation first. Seema, welcome and thank you for, for sponsoring to 
today's event as you always do. We're really grateful for that. So Seema, you're recognized. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending as well. We really appreciate this opportunity each year. Um, so my name is um, Seema Jan, and I'm a member of the board of the League of Women Voters of Arlington. Um, and the League does appreciate this opportunity to address the members of the General Assembly um, each year. So this is a unique year in many ways, as everyone knows, um, and we really appreciate it by the General Assembly to engage in our voting system during the November elections. Now we ask that the election mechanisms that were put into place during the special session for this past election to become permanent. These include safe, secure, and conveniently placed drop boxes, permanently removing the unnecessary and restrictive witness signature, 1097, um, allowing voters to correct or cure their, their mail-in ballots for minor procedural errors, such as failing to sign their ballot, um, and enforcing preclearance at the state level of practices that are restricted under the federal Voting Rights Act. Um, in Shelby County um, v. Holder, the Supreme Court struck an opt and local election changes risk disenfranchising voters. Um, indeed, in, in former preclearance states, many voters have been losing their right to vote through illegal voter roll purges and other changes. Virginia should set up a state level preclearance process. So major elections changes in former preclearance areas, such as moving a polling place far from public transportation, must be cleared first by state officials, such as the Attorney General or the Circuit Court in Richmond. Um, we are also um, including, we also encourage, um, you know, passing the 100% right to vote constitutional amendment which um, would allow all citizens in Virginia 18 years of age or older access to the polls without restrictions. And that's SJ8 and SB272. We also encourage Virginia's participation in the National Popular Vote Compact, um, that's SB1101 and HB177. Um, we think it's appalling that Virginia campaign finance laws are seventh out of 50th. Therefore, we need to impose reasonable spending limits. Um, other states tend to follow the federal model, prohibiting personal use of campaign funds. Also, we support give or an independent oversight agency tools to conduct investigations and enforce consequences. Um, we do applaud and support Senator Evans SJ270, which seeks to repeal the Virginia Constitutional Amendment limiting marriage marriage to that man. And, and finally, in light of COVID-19 and the many hardships facing families in Virginia, we encourage the General Assembly to direct state courts to set a moratorium on home evictions until certain criteria are met, such as a certain reduction in the unemployment rate or the COVID-19 vaccine is administered to a certain percentage of the population, something like that. We also ask you to establish relief for landlords who suffer when tenants are unable to pay rent. Um, so on behalf of the League, thank you for your continued service to the citizens of Arlington and the state. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. Thank you so much. And thank you again to the League for sponsoring this, this uh, venue. Of course, we really appreciate it. Uh, just to remind everyone, for those that have just come in, uh, again, if you want to uh, testify, please uh, go into the, the uh, participant function and click on raise hand, and I will recognize the speakers based on when, they, when they've done that. The only thing that I would ask that you do is that when you do come forward and testify, we are providing two minutes for uh, in individual speakers. If you're representing a group, however, we will recognize you for three minutes. So if you would uh, tell me that when we call on you, uh, that would be appreciated so that we can allot the time that way. And we will let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining. So, and we'll be very flexible on that, but not too flexible. So our first speaker will be uh, Lucy B. now, followed by Marcella Suyaya. Lucy, welcome, thank you for being here. 
Thank you all so much for having me. So I am Lucy Biednell with the Arc of Northern Virginia and a longtime Arlington resident. I'm so happy to be speaking with you all tonight. 2020 has been an awful year for just about everyone and that goes doubly so for people with developmental disabilities or maybe triply so because people with developmental disabilities are 300% more likely to die from COVID infections than the typically developing population. Our caregivers are burning out and our students are struggling with virtual school and a lack of services. So in the 2021 session, we have a few critical goals. First, to protect the waiver rate increases and waiver slot increases that were already maintained in this special session. I have never known at a time that was this critical to get waivers out to people struggling to keep their heads above water and to get some financial relief to our Medicaid waiver providers who are exposed to the virus daily and keep showing up to keep our community safe. Second, we're hoping for some COVID specific relief for our providers. At this point, no end is in sight for our day and employment providers who haven't opened their doors since March and haven't been able to bill for services nor our residential providers who went from being morning, evening, and weekend to 24 seven nonstop and are spending millions of dollars on PPE and overtime that they can't recoup. Third, we're hoping to see some legislative reform that protects the rights of people with developmental disabilities. Bills are coming to promote recognition of developmental disabilities by first responders to help keep people with developmental disabilities out of the criminal justice system where we are 300% more likely than our percentage in the population to be found in jail and 400% more in juvenile facilities. You'll also be seeing bills to promote inclusive education in response to a JLARC study this year and their recommendations on how important that is for students with and without disabilities and our state bottom line. So thank you for all the work you are headed to Richmond to do and everything you've done already. We really have the best delegation here. Thank you so much, Ms. Biednell. Uh, next speaker is Marcella Suaya, followed by Carol Skelly. I hope you pronounced your name close enough. Apologies. Ms. Suaya, are you there? I believe you're on mute. Can you hear me? Well, there, there is an echo. I think you got to put one of your because you called in twice, or you have two, one of them's got to be on mute. I just hung up. Yeah, one Good. of them. Good evening. Perfect. I can hear you great. Okay. Thank cool. you. Thank you for your patience. Good evening. My name is Marcella. Can you see me? No, I cannot. Okay. Thank you. I attended preschool in Arlington County and my children have two. Since Arlington County is one of the richest counties in the country, I was not surprised when people congratulated me on my resident status upon learning that I was expecting a child with Down syndrome. While pregnant, I got in touch with Arlington's Parent Infant Education PIE program and learned about their services. Like the pregnancy, things have not gone according to plan and it's not all the pandemic's fault. Arlington County's leadership has taken the physical out of physical therapy. In our daughter's lifetime, she has had twice the amount of virtual sessions than she has had in-person physical therapy sessions. I understand a lot can get done virtually, but physical therapy is not so conducive to this model. I'm now diverting funds from our household's budget to provide her with in-person physical therapy. Being denied in-person physical therapy does not prepare Marisol, our child, to be ready to join the inclusive education model recommended in the 2020 JLARC study. In addition to enrolling in the PI program, I joined the board of the Down Syndrome Association of Northern Virginia, DSAMB. In this role, I've learned that regardless of how proactive I am about lining up services using Medicaid waivers, they may never materialize due to wait lists. Please protect the Medicaid waiver slot increases that were maintained in the special session so that when it comes time to provide Marisol with support that goes beyond my family's means and expertise, it will be there. In closing, for Marisol to not be a burden on our society, she needs to be ready to function in our community, and our community needs to be ready to let her contribute. 
providing in-person physical therapy through the PI program, having a 100% inclusive education system, and having services ready using Medicaid waivers provides the infrastructure needed to position Marisol to be a contributor and not just a cost. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Carol Skelly, followed by Grant Sizemore. Ms. Skelly, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much, Delegate Hope. I'm speaking on behalf of the Developmental Disabilities Committee of the Arlington Community Services Board. First, I wanna thank all of you for the tremendous time and effort you put into the regular and special General Assembly sessions this year. For developmental disabilities, we were very grateful that the waiver rate refresh was restored. The refresh will raise DD waiver reimbursement rates by between four and 7%, depending on the service, beginning this January 1. Our top priority for the upcoming session is to retain these rate increases at a full year cost of $25.7 million. Our second priority is to rebase the rates to make them more competitive. The recent increases followed eight years of flat rates. If we do not make a more fundamental adjustment, DD services will continue to suffer from high vacancy rates and staff turnover. The turnover in my son's Arlington waiver group home was 75% in calendar 2020. So you can see that 5% while it's, uh, it's helpful is really not going to address the fundamental systemic problem we have with these rates. DD services were included only selectively in CARES Act funding and coverage ends January 1st. So if additional federal funds become available, we ask that you ensure an equitable distribution that considers the needs of vulnerable DD clients along with their low wage direct care health providers. Specifically, we need retainer payments for day support programs, which have been closed, as Ms. Biednell said, since late March. We need retainer payments for residential providers of $20 per client per day to cover additional care expenses, staff overtime, and PPE. And we also would like to see hazard payments for staff of DD group residential programs who care for COVID cases, comparable to that that was made available to assisted living and nursing homes. We look forward to working with you on these issues. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Ms. Skelly. Uh, Grant Sizemore, followed by Julia Tanner. Mr. Sizemore, welcome. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Grant Sizemore I, and tonight I am speaking uh, both as a constituent and uh, as a representative of American Bird Conservancy. Uh, American Bird Conservancy is a national nonprofit organization and uh, we're dedicated to the conservation of native birds and their habitats. So tonight I'd like to bring to your attention a couple of bills that are of concern to, uh, to me and my organization. These bills, uh, one of which is House Bill 1727 and the other is uh, yet to be identified. Uh, is in the process of being introduced. Both of these bills propose to release stray and feral cats into the environment as part of programs known as trap, neuter, release, uh, and return to field. Now, American Bird Conservancy supports the effective management of stray and feral cats, but purposely maintaining these cats on the landscape, whether sterilized or not, uh, is not only inhumane to cats, but also a serious threat to wildlife and a risk to public health. Every year in the United States, outdoor cats kill an estimated 2.4 billion birds. It's billion with a B. Furthermore, cats are the top source of rabies among domestic animals in the United States. And between 2001 and 2018, rabid cats in Virginia surpassed rabid dogs by over eight to one. Cats are also the definitive host for toxoplasmosis, which can cause miscarriages in pregnant women, blindness, and even death and is caused by infection with a parasite excreted in cat feces. American Bird Conservancy is definitely not anti-cat. I don't wanna give you that impression. I'm a cat owner myself, but uh, we support programs that benefit both cats and the community. 
things like responsible cat ownership and effective stray and feral animal management that simultaneously protects domestic animals, wildlife, and people. Uh, so on behalf of American Bird Conservancy and our supporters, I ask that you please oppose House Bill 1727 and any bill that purposely maintains stray and feral cats on the landscape. Uh, ultimately, it's really time to, to just treat cats like we treat dogs. Uh, so I want to say thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Sizemore. Thank you for being here. Uh, next speaker is Julia Tanner, followed by Jeanette O'Keefe. Ms. Tanner, welcome. Uh, hello. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak, and thank you all for your thoughtful work in the General Assembly. Um, speaking tonight as a constituent, I really appreciate all of your hard work. And um, I would like to uh, second the uh, remarks of Seema Jane. Uh, I appreciated those um, supports from the Arlington League uh, for access by voters. I will just very quickly run through them because she already gave you the reasons. Uh, but basically it's very important um, in the Commonwealth to make sure that people are able to successfully access um, voting, particularly during the franchise, but also going during the pandemic, but also going into the future and making permanent the temporary supports for voter access that were passed in the special session, thanks to the hard work of, of several of you, including um, Senator Janet Howell and um, uh, Senator Adam Eben in particular, but also others of you. Um, we were so grateful um, for your leadership on those initiatives and um, as well as course of delegate um, Sickles. And um, we think that those should be made permanent. And um, when I say we, I happen, to, I'm a member of organizations that support that, including the, the State League of Women Voters, but I'm here as a constituent simply saying, I, I agree with making these permanent. I also agree that preclearance at the state level of practices restricted under the Federal Voting Rights Act would be important. Uh, I know that some of these are difficult asks for you, but I do ask you to consider them um, as feasible. They can be done. And in this particular circumstance, given the fact that the Supreme Court may not be the sort that would go back on something like Shelby County versus Holder in a future decision, um, and Congress may or may not make changes, it may be up to the states. And in, in this case, making sure that inadvertent changes are not made that disenfranchise voters would be very helpful. Um, the 100% right to vote constitutional amendment. Uh, also, you, you know well the arguments. We've heard many uh, lawmakers are interested in just um, automatic restoration of rights. I won't say just because that's still amazing. However, the 100% right to vote would actually avoid disenfranchising people in the first place which would be the ideal. And I know that some people would say, well, you know, that's difficult, that's felons, how would that go over? And they tend to vote Democrat, wouldn't that be a type Republican? I think that it would be important for everyone to set partisan politics aside and just think about the fact that these are Virginians, they deserve the right to vote, plain and simple. That's part of our democracy. Campaign finance reform, I think Seema Jane said it very well. You've all heard the arguments and I personally believe that it should be coupled with um, giving y'all a living wage for what you do. Um, that's my personal thoughts. Uh, national popular vote. I want to also thank uh, Senator Eben for his uh, leadership on this very important initiative. I think this is the year. I think that in the presidential election, everyone saw why it's so important to, um, uh, you know, when the, the popular vote uh, may not necessarily indicate the way that electors are going to vote. And um, that's very frustrating to the majority of the population. Uh, finally, broadband coverage, of course, is important. Uh, think of all those students trying to access uh, education during this time. And then finally, if do I have time to give two other? You could wrap your overtime, but if you could wrap up really quickly. We'll give you I will time. wrap up really quickly. Um, I uh, also believe that it's so important for women uh, right now to be able to use available sick leave for family care. Uh, the evidence suggests that paid leave policies reduce absenteeism and benefit their employers because the fewer people get sick. Um, and so therefore, I think the solution would be paid sick leave for family care. And I believe Senator uh, Favola may be interested in filing a bill on that. Um, and we would, I would certainly support that along with several other people that I know. Um, and then um, paid sick leave for personal care workers under Medicaid would also be very helpful to the Commonwealth um, with these 
critical workers um, during this difficult time. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tanner. Thank you so much for being here. A uh, couple other speakers left, but for those of you that came in late, just wanna make sure you know that if you wanna uh, speak, uh, if I'd ask that you go to the participants function and click the raise hand feature, and I will recognize you. Um, I have a couple of hands that are still raised, but if you didn't get that message, please raise your hand if you'd like to testify. Uh, I have uh, Jeanette O'Keefe followed by Sheila Billingsley. Ms. O'Keefe, welcome. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank you very much for having this event tonight. I, I think it's extremely important for Arlington I think it's important for all of us who, who work with different uh, areas of concern in Arlington and different groups uh, like myself, I'm the present chair of the CSB, uh, to hear about broader concerns that are in Arlington, to understand how they impact all the people that we work with. And so I think it's a very valuable thing and thank you for being here. I'm not going to go into a lot of specifics because I know we've spoken to many of you before and also because we're about to bombard you with uh, quite a bit of paperwork dealing with our specifics. But I would like to um, say that uh, just for those who may not be as familiar with the CSB, the Community Services Board, uh, I'm here to speak for those who are among our most vulnerable and unable to speak for themselves. Those who have the challenges of dealing with developmental disability, and you heard um, in two um, presentations uh, this evening already um, about the con concerns that they have. And I would like to thank Carol Skelly for speaking on behalf of uh, developmental disability uh, from the CSB. Um, uh, these, the folks that we work with have the challenges of dealing with that, uh, developmental disability, as well as mental health illness, substance use disorder, and these special situations that exist within children, youth, and families, and older adults. To be the society we know ourselves able to be, we must provide for those who have both ongoing illnesses and those who are capable of recovering and returning to become contributive members of society. So I would like to thank you to, for all you have done to help these members of society before. We have some very serious issues we're dealing with right now. Isolation, you've already heard about. It's an enormous problem for um, all of our divisions. Uh, it's remarkable what our staff has done. Uh, moving within two weeks to telehealth, and we're very proud of what they're able to do and what they continue to do. We're very proud of our committees and the members who have become very creative in ways of, uh, even without the capability for uh, people to get together, they've been able to create solutions that, um, that, um, that provide um, opportunities for um, all of some of our consumers to interact in a way that's very uh, important for them. We have great concerns within certain areas of, um, for example, substance abuse. Our numbers have tripled in regard to opiate use and concerns and incidents, and they've quadrupled in terms of drug-related suicides. With, and this is all within just the past year. This is comparing it to last year. So uh, we are trying to get the word out in the community uh, through public service announcements, through going out and teaching about Narcan and how lives can be saved through this, um, knowing, understanding how to use this medicine, it's readily available. Um, we are doing our best to reach people and prevent these um, tragic situations from occurring. Everyone is busy. Uh, child and youth is working uh, very heavily with the school system, trying to uh, avert needs as they arrive, trying to meet the new challenges that exist in children, uh, not being able to get together as normal. Um, and uh, each of the divisions is, is striving to do the best they can. In regard to the mental health division, they have three things that they, that they would like to bring to your attention. The d dire need for psychiatric beds, continued funding for STEP VA, and 
looking toward the future of forecasts for more uh, mental health group homes. Basically, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to mention once again the people that we serve and thank you for all you do to help them in their walks in life. And th thank you, Ms. Oki. Thank you for your leadership on the board. Appreciate that very much. Uh, we have uh, Chris DeRosa followed by Sheila Billingsley. Ms. DeRosa, thank you for being here. You are on mute. Chris, you're on mute. There you go. There you go. It was off and then it went back on. So I'm Chris DeRosa. Nice to sort of see you, but you can't see me. I'm a retired special ed teacher, longtime Arlington resident, and a community volunteer and activist. And I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, but I'm here as an individual tonight. I wanna to start by thanking the League of Arlington for organizing this opportunity to talk with you. And next, I want to thank you, our delegates and senators, for all that you have accomplished in 2020, the amazing long-awaited legislation, including the ERA on day one, bills to make voting easier and safer, bills to reduce gun violence, and for equality bills. Senators Eben, Favola, and Howell, I wanna thank you for your steadfast support of Amendment 1, which you know that I probably uh, supported and that has set us on the path for fair redistricting. To my de delegates, I love you, but I'm a little disappointed in your position. But now what I wanna do is ask all of you to support the redistricting commission and process and do all that you can to make Virginia's efforts successful. Please encourage your constituents to apply for a seat on the commission in the next two weeks. My main ask tonight is as, um, a leader of Spread the Vote in Arlington and Falls Church. I've helped many returning citizens uh, check to see whether they can vote. I've helped them to apply to have their rights restored and found that many of them didn't realize that rights had already been restored because of various reasons. Some of them thought they could never vote again and they were amazed when they found out they could in fact start voting. And as you probably are aware, most of these citizens are people of color. Voting is a fundamental right that we need to give them. So SJ 272 is Senator Mamie Locke's amendment that would guarantee the right to vote to all Virginians ages 18 and older. It would stop the disenfranchisement of people convicted of felonies, which estimates put at 300,000 Virginians. At the very least, I hope that maybe you would consider writing and sponsoring legislation that would provide for the automatic rest restoration of rights for returning citizens. Once a person has completed his or her prison sentence and re-enters society, he or she should have the right to vote restored automatically. Finally, an interesting, uh, another idea I have, uh, I got in a webinar with Matthew Desmond just last night, the author of Evicted. It's shameful that five of the 10 American cities with the highest eviction rates are in Virginia. One of the ideas that he suggested is guaranteeing free legal representation to those who are being hauled into civil court for eviction hearings. I think that's an idea that we should consider. So thank you for your time. I'm sorry that I won't be able to come and see you in Richmond. I hope that you all have a happy and healthy holiday season. Thank you so much, Ms. DeRosa. I appreciate you being here. Uh, I don't have any other speakers. Is there anyone else that didn't get a chance to speak that would like to speak? You can either raise your hand or you can signal to me through the chat that you would like to speak. Oh, I see Ms. Woolley has raised her hand. Ms. Woolley, you're recognized. Thank you for being here. You are on mute, Ms. Woolley. You were still on mute. There we go. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. It kept popping up different buttons. Um, I apologize. Um, I'm Michelle Woolley. I think most of you all know me at this point. Um, I live in uh, Senator Evans district in Fairlington. Um, and I'm also on the board of Arlington for Justice, as well as my day job being working um, as managing director of Justice Forward Virginia. Um, and I hadn't planned to speak tonight, but since there's a little time, um, I just wanted to call in to encourage you. Several of you have been really great in our patroning bills for us in the uh, on criminal justice reform issues 
in the um, general session, um, uh, Delegate Hope, you did great work um, uh, in this past se special session. And I just, you know, some of our concerns have been that some of the, you know, with the bill limits and all of these things happening, that not all of these bills are going to get covered and we're going to lose steam on some of these things while we, while there's a democratic majority and kind of a will and a focus on this. So I just want to make sure to encourage all of you. Um, I know some of you are already helping, um, but to continue to work on these things, um, we have a lot more work to do in Virginia um, to address these issues of equity and racial injustice in our criminal, uh, some would say injustice system, not a justice system. And so I just want to reach that out and we'll be sending more info to you, but I just, you know, just want to reiterate that in this forum as well. And as a constituent, not just for as my uh, paid job. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Woolley. Appreciate you being here and appreciate your advocacy. Uh, is, there, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Last call. You can uh, say in the chat function that you would like to speak. Alternatively, you can raise your hand. Patrick, there's a question in the Q&A section. The question is, will there be legislation introduced to allow for same day voting registration or extend voter registration time period? I would imagine that is a yes. Anyone know differently? Anyone want to speak directly to that? No, no takers. Patrick, the person was asking about same day voter registration. Right. Didn't we already pass that with a with the delayed that's enactment? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That will take place next year, twenty two. Yeah, that's correct. Right there's your answer. There's your answer. Okay, so does anyone have any last minute thing to say? Because we can adjourn. Does anyone want to close us out before I close out, Senator Favot? I, I do have one thing. Um, for those of you who like to send us written comments because you know two minutes is a brief period of time, I would suggest you go ahead and email your comments to each member of the delegation. And we're very easy to find. Um, and each one of us also has a website. So I would suggest you, you go to our websites, uh, you can contact us there um, and follow us because each one of us comes up with a newsletter when we're in session and we keep you up to date. I know that you're a very diligent group and you care deeply about these issues. So you need to follow us so you know what's going on in a timely fashion. Um, and of course, I think we're all on social media, Facebook and Twitter and all that. But, um, but I do suggest that you go to our websites and, and sign up for our newsletters and email us our comments if that, your comments, if that's your preference. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, uh, this is gonna be a very unique session. And so figuring out some different creative lines of communication to, to, uh, to, to communicate with us, whether it's through email or phone, is going to be really important since we're not going to be able to see many of you in person. And so, um, so this will be a unique session. So uh, does anyone have anything last words to say before we close out? Okay, well, well, thank Happy you. Holidays. Happy holidays. Thank, thank you everyone for, for being here. We take your comments very seriously. We appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thanks everyone. Nice to be with you all. We stand adjourned. You. Good night. Stay safe. Happy holidays.